Trajectory repair for mocap using kinematic reference. And Maxim is going to do the talk. Hello, everyone. So, my name is Maxim Brevichuk, and uh, I'm going to be presenting this robust marker trajectory repair. Uh, this is a work done in collaboration between Concordia University and uh, Ubisoft The Forge. So, that was all. Thanks. And uh, I didn't mention, but I'm a master student at Concordia University. <coughs> so, the motivation behind this is this. What we want to get to animation data for games, there's two main methods. Traditionally, we can do keyframing, which you all know is a, the old approach, uh, where we simply get the data and the artist sits down and generates keyframes and you blend between. Usually what we do now is we use mocap. So lately in academia, markerless mocap has been making very uh, strides, we can say, uh, but it's still not quite to the level of quality where we want from a AAA production. However, it's slowly getting there. Uh, we're still really relying on passive marker systems, so such as the Vicon, which is actually behind you. Uh, that's the system that you can use it yourself. Um, there are some issues with the system. Uh, it's not perfect, although it does a very good job. The main issue is this. So we can take a look at the actual mocap pipeline. We started a mocap studio. That's me, by the way. Uh, I get into a suit, and then we get the marker data. But now we have some corruption in the marker data. And if we go one step further, and we get the kinematic solution for our market data, our kinematic solution might be broken as well because of the market data. And then finally, we get complete garbage results in the game. Uh, this is not me, but you know. Uh, so there's two ideas here. Idea number one is that with each step, you lose quality, right? So you're sort of getting further from the original ground truth on the floor. The second idea is that this first step is very important, right? So if you don't correctly get the markers from your original data, you're not going to get good results. So why does this happen? Well, there's a couple reasons. So these markers will usually have error gaps when we lose them, right? So um, this happens for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there's marker occlusions. So when two characters, for instance, are fighting or something, uh, it gets behind the character in between the camera, the cameras can't see the, uh, the markers. We lose them. Uh, there's marker swaps, so this is inherent to, uh, to passive marker systems. So you don't really know the difference between two markers, and the system can sometimes swap them, and now you get garbage results. And then there's trajectory errors also, which what I mean by this is that sometimes when the marker goes missing, the system will at least detect that it's missing, but at other times it will leave these errorless trajectories within your marker data. So that's another problem. And the key takeaway from here is that in order to fix this, AAA Studios will employ uh, mocap artists, and they will fix it at this stage, right? So these markers, uh, these uh, mocap artists are trained to work on the markers and to fix their trajectories. You could foreseeably do it further down the pipeline, but the problem with this is that you're getting further away from the ground truth data, and it's harder to, uh, to recreate it. So this is the stage where we generally want to fix it. But this is time consuming and expensive, and most importantly, it's a bottleneck for production. Ideally, we have something like this, where everything goes, goes smooth and your motion transfers seamlessly to delivery. So there's a couple of solutions to this. One solution, one category of solutions that I like to call is marker level solutions. Here we're dealing with the problem on a marker per marker basis. So we look at the animation markers. And we solve them individually. There's been a lot of work on this uh, for quite a while now. There's uh, marker PCA methods, which do a principal component analysis on them and try to find the correlation and fix the missing markers. And there's a lot of data-driven methods. Uh, and by this, I, I mean quite a lot of methods that range from classical data-driven approaches to uh, deep learning approaches, such as the latest that push I didn't go on. Um, a lot of these work, but the main issue with is that them is that they don't take into account the kinematic validity of your data. And what this means is that, remember from the pipeline I showed you, the markers is not what ends up going into the game. It's the kinematic hierarchical structure. So you can fix markers, and on an individual level, they'll be all right. But what will happen is that once you actually solve it, your kinematic solution will still be wrong. So that brings us to the second category of uh, solutions. Kinematic level solutions. So what these solutions do is that they solve directly. 
they skip the whole marker step, and basically what you're trying to do is input the markers and get out the correct kinematic solution. The advantage of this is pretty obvious. The kinematic solution, if, if your problem is inherently saying, I want a correct, correct kinematic solution, then you're going to get, if your method works well, you're going to get it. And you're, it's also going to be your bus business. So there's a lot of commercial solvers out there, such as Vicon, but there's, there are others as well. And there's a lot of data-driven methods that have recently been, become very efficient. Uh, one which we're going to focus on today is by Holden 2018. Uh, Dan Holden is one of the uh, co-authors of this paper. Um, he works at Microsoft. And this method is basically a very robust method to deal with, uh, deal with this problem. But remember, it spits out at the end a kinematic solution. So you don't really deal with the markers anymore. Now that's a problem. Because this becomes very hard to integrate in production. So imagine this scenario. Your, your system, no matter how good it gets, it's probably not going to be 100%. There's still going to be edge cases where there's too many markers missing. It's very hard to recreate motion. But now, if you skip the markers, all those trained marker artists can no longer do their job, right? Because your motion is now in kinematic space. You don't have the markers. So this is problematic. This becomes hard to integrate. So what we want to do, ideally, is merge both worlds. Have the stability of the kinematic systems while also have the, the, having the integration potential of the market-based systems. So here's our contribution here. Uh, we start with a raw market data. We label, label it X. And we use a kinematic, kinematic solution, uh, sorry, a commercial kinematic solution, in this case, Vicon, to represent the broken market data in kinematic space. So this solution is intended to be broken. You have broken markers, you get a broken solution. Next, we use a state-of-the-art solver. In this case, it's a modified version of Holden 2018. I can uh, take questions later on what exactly we changed to it. Uh, pretty much augmented it, make it to perform slightly better. So we input that, and this is now Y hat, as we call it. This is the uh, fixed kinematic solution. So what we can do is we can compare the two on a per joint level. Uh, based on rotations and positions. And from this, we can determine which joints at which time frames are errors. But now we're stuck with joints again. Remember, so this is the main issue. We want to go back to markers levels so that if it's broken, the marker artists can still do their job and fix the, fix the motion. So what we can do is we can regenerate markers from our correct solution here uh, using linear blend scanning. Call that x hat. And then finally blend this using blending algorithm that we propose with the original markers X. So the ideal, ideal is this. If a marker is correct, we don't touch it. We leave it as it is. If a marker is erroneous, we will use this reference path in order to fix it. Finally, this whole blend output, we call it X bar. And in order to make sure that our solution is valid, kinematically speaking. Uh, we regenerate the final kinematic solution. We use a commercial solver here because we don't, it's already assumed that these markers are going to be correct. But th this path will work. So now I'll go a bit into detail on some of the processes, although not all of them because we kind of short on time. If you, if you guys want, I can, I can elaborate them in the question period. So firstly, here's the uh, marker reconstruction process. So basically, we use linear blend scanning in order to reconstruct the markers. Um, you can think of this as sort of vertices on a mesh, right? And uh, you can regenerate them using linear blend scanning. We have a whole data set of uh, joints compared to markers, and we can get the, the weights from there. So as I said, this, these new markers are pointing at x hat, and they represent the correct kinematic solution in marker space. Now, one could ask, why don't we simply use the Markers. Why do we have to blend between the two? Well, there's a couple issues. So first off, the, uh, the kinematic solver we use, the Holden 2018, it's based on a fully connect connected network, and it uses, at, at the end, it uses some filtering techniques to make it smooth in the time domain. The problem here is that you lose small details. So often in fingers, for instance, or in small arm movements, you're going to lose that in, these, in the clean markers. 
And the second problem is that even if a marker is correct, uh, so let's say we deem the whole animation to be correct. These recruited markers, due to the fact that we use LBS and real humans don't deform based on LBS, uh, these markers are still going to be offset from the real position of the markers. And this is something that, uh, that artists just don't like, right? They, they tell us that uh, this is undesired behavior. So the next point is gap filling. So once we've uh, reconstructed, reconstructed the markers, determined which intervals are incorrect, we want to fill some intervals. So we look at a, at a gap here. So in gray here, it's hard to see a bit, but uh, this is the original path. And at some point, we determine which is the start frame and the end frame of the gap. We have the reference path and we have the original path. We get the difference in positions and we get the difference in velocities between the two. And we fit a degree five polynomial. Uh, we have four constraints and we use degree five. And then we subtract this polynomial from the reference path in order to generate this blended path here. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, this blended path here. Okay. So there's some degenerate cases here with this that we need to think about. Um, so firstly, remember that I mentioned that sometimes you get tra trajectory errors, so it's not a clean break. Sometimes before a marker is deemed missing or erroneous, um, you'll get something like this. So this is the gray path. It just goes paler. Or here, so this is before a marker reappears, or here's a marker before it disappears, it just flies off. Um, and you can do a couple things here. Firstly, this works kind of really well based on the, compared to what it is. You can simply cut out a section amount of frames. So just say 100 frames from each side. Uh, the reason this works is because the uh, kinematic solver itself is fairly, fairly efficient and uh, it can regenerate those frames. So you're better off cutting off more frames than, uh, than having various frames in your final solution. You can also do, what, what, one other thing we do is search for the best, best place to uh, blend. So we define the best place to blend as a location which minimizes the differences in velocities, because if you have very high differences in velocities, the blend is going to go haywire. And then finally, if all else fails, um, we can simply clamp this difference in a polynomial. So we pretty much limit the con continuity in the velocity domain in favor of having uh, the to, to have a continuous spin in the position domain. There's some other techniques here in the Q&A uh, that I've recently thought about using, and uh, I'll, I can mention it a bit later in the future work section, which could improve this section as well. So let's take a look at the results. So on the left, uh, you're gonna have them, I'm colorblind, so I don't know my result. I know this one is, is ours. Um, so you can see our result. This is Y bar at the very end, remember? So once we get our markers, we regenerate a final kinematic solution. On the left, you see our work compared to uh, GMT 2018 and Lorsen 2016. So th th for this frame, it's fairly good. Um, although the other Lorsen does fairly well as well. Here's a very hard clip. Uh, this is very challenging for, uh, for artists to fix. Because basically what happens is that you get two characters that are wrestling with each other. Um, I think there's something like half the markers go missing. So it's very hard to get any sort of construction. Uh, even, admittedly, our method here on the hand there's some issues as well. It's not 100% perfect. But it performs better than the other methods we tested against, and it's still fairly stable. Here you see uh, markers go missing in the hips in this scenario. Um, the hips are a very challenging region as well, because a lot of methods rely on a rigid body fitting system. Um, and if that fails, then, sorry about that then the whole thing will fail. One other thing you will see here is a, a comparison for some given clip that we tested. Uh, we even outperformed our modified version of Holden 2018, even if we're based on it. Now this might seem weird, weird at first, since we're basing it on this method. But the main reason for this is that, remember, if the markers are correct, we don't touch them. So the small offset per marker causes this discrepancy. Here's a representation in video form. So we, as this clip progresses, there are some, clip, there are some, uh, some markers that get, get missing within the, the hips. 
And on a lot of methods, they break. Our method is on the left again. The markers being represented here are the final output markers, by the way, not the original markers. In summary, uh, sorry about that, the timing is somewhat fun. Uh, in summary, our method has some limitations. Um, one is the dependency on the kinematic solver. So I might have mentioned before, but I have to emphasize we're not, there's no reason why we have to use the whole 2018. It's simply what we use, but we can use any sufficiently robust kinematic solver. But regardless, which whatever problems this solver will have, our method will also have. Right? So we're relying on this to be the basis of our method. Secondly is the dependency on the degree 5 polynomial. I'll talk about that in a second. And uh, finally is that, remember that clip with the wrestling? Um, at some points, enough markers go missing that the results become ambiguous. It's hard to tell uh, what the original actors intended to do. Um, actually, what mocap artists do is they open up the video that was shot originally side by side and use that to fix the data. So in terms of future work, we can try a couple of things. We could use a different kinematic solver. We could use a different IP process. This process is used within the, uh, the original Holden 2018, and it's a bottleneck for a process in terms of uh, performance. We could improve on the blending. So one idea we've, I've personally had is to use inertialization, which is a technique for motion matching. Um, we pretty much make try to blend this curve so that the jerk is zero, and that would get rid of some of the issues. Um, and then finally, one possible future avenue is to integrate with markerless systems. And what I mean by this is that since we already have a video from the uh, live shoot, we could potentially use this video to generate markerless uh, joint transformations and only use them when we rely on the other methods completely broken. So, in summary, this was our presentation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ubisoft The Forge. Olivier Palmares, Daniel Holden, and the Palace, uh, Ubisoft Palace, for their contribution to the work. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Uh, no, so even the yeah, uh, so even the original system it works quite well with different body shapes. Um, we train on a, a variety. So, hold it 2018 is the method we rely on, and that method we train on a variety of different actor state shapes. I'd say around 12 actors is fairly good to cover uh, to cover most ranges. You might get some extremes with uh, very small or very tall characters, but for overall range, it's pretty good. Okay. Uh, that's Yeah. Uh, what are your local system you use to, to, to do that two-person wrestling though? Uh, Mycon. Mycon. Mycon Shogun. I personally didn't do it, so I don't know the exact yeah, details. I asked, I asked because we tried some things, so we didn't find this problem. So uh, you never found that problem? No. We tried to pick it back in this case, mm -hmm. where still half the markers were missing. But the, the their software were good enough to sort that out. So what if it's going to be clear things we want to do? Uh, well, I'm not sure I, I could ask the uh, people in yourself, but uh, yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, could you talk a little bit more about how you discriminate between a good mark and a bad marker? What sure, great. So, go back here. To detect the Aranus intervals, what we look at is the differences between the joints, right? So it's, it seems fairly a simple process, but basically what it does, right, is we look at the differences, and if they're greater than some threshold, we say that the associated markers are missing. So all the markers associated to, for instance, the upper leg joint, we determine them to be errors for that frame. Um, then we also pad those frames, as I mentioned before, using a variety of different methods. Um, another thing we do is we also get rid of small sections of data. So if, if a marker is, let's say it's errorness, 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 and then it's good for like three seconds, and then it's errorness again, we just get rid of that data completely because it's, there's no point in blending. We might as well just use the reference path for that section. Great, thank you.
Okay, let's thank our speaker.